and I want to welcome everybody to our monthly Oracle Temple Spirituality Salon. As I just indicated, we tackle and welcome a variety of topics. Um, some people might think that environmentalism is in spiritual. To us, it is. Love of this planet to us is a very high order value, um, which we cherish. So it is my great pleasure tonight to welcome three very active environmentalists um, who happen to be local to us, but as I, I said a minute ago, actually operate sometimes on a national and even international level. Um, so we're gonna have three presentations. They're each gonna be about 10 minutes each, and I'm gonna introduce the speakers um, one at a time right before they speak. So tonight, we are gonna start with Elizabeth Underwood, who enjoys being on rivers. She is an avid paddler of both tandem canoes and white water kayaking. And she and her husband enjoy multi-day river ex expeditions. Among their favorite adventures, they paddled all 153 miles of the Buffalo River, which is America's first national river. Today, Elizabeth is in charge of protecting another national heritage river, the New River, which actually is the oldest river in the Western Hemisphere and possibly the oldest river in the world. She brings two decades of experience in higher education and nonprofit management to her role as executive director of the New River Conservancy. Elizabeth holds a BA in literature from the University of North Carolina a master's in higher education and a PhD in public policy from the University of Arkansas. She also is a Fulbright scholar and she's won many awards for her years of public service. So welcome Elizabeth. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for the salon. Thank you so much for inviting me. I was clapping because Charlotte Haynes is wearing her New River Conservancy t-shirt um, and that just brings a huge smile to my face. Um, before I get started tonight to talk about the New River, um, I, again, just thank you for inviting me to have this forum. I love speaking about the New River. Um, but when I saw the, the promotions about this event, I was actually reminded of one of my all-time favorite concerts. And I, I'll, I'm going to date myself. This was about 20 years ago. I saw Dave Matthews Band uh, live at Scott Stadium in Charlottesville, Virginia. It was his homecoming concert. And opening up for uh, Dave Matthews was Neil Young and Crazy mm -hmm. Horse. So Dave Matthews came out on stage and he said, I'm so humbled to, to share the stage with, with Neil Young tonight. I don't know why he's opening for me. I should be opening for him. And whenever I saw the, the panelists, that are joining me tonight, I thought, gosh, I don't know why I'm the first person to go because I'm really on the stage or Zoom channel tonight with legends. Um, you know, Charlotte Haynes and Kathy Cole, you all um, helped get the New River, protected it. I know you're shaking your head, but I really, I, I look to you as the legend. So um, I should be your backup tonight. And I'm really just humbled to, to share the stage with you. So I, I wanted to start off with a note of gratitude uh, for you all and all the other volunteers and activists who have helped preserve our new river. Um, as it was mentioned, the new river is one of our oldest rivers in the world. Um, it does flow north and why it flows north um, through the Appalachian regions is because it actually predates um, the Appalachian uh, mountains. The New River um, was, was flowing north long before the mountains were formed. And um, we know that the Appalachian mountains are some of the oldest rivers in the world. So that helps give a time frame um, to the New River. Um, and so I'm going to speak for about 10 minutes on some of the many things that the New River Conservancy does. Um, I've been the executive director since June 1st, and so I'm really um, standing on the shoulders of those who came before me. Um, but it, it's a great honor to lead this organization because we're doing so many wonderful things. Um, and so I mentioned a little bit about our history, and I also wanted to share with you all just a, a plug. I'm an avid reader, and a book that was pointed out to me is called The New River Controversy 
uh, not the New River Conservancy, but the New River Controversy. And it, it really talks about, um, you know, the geologic origins and the, that wonderful rich history, but also the social history um, of, of why the river is a, a, a national river, wild and scenic and American, American heritage. Um, and, and that's because of the legends that really fought to protect it. Um, it, it might be um, for 40,000 acres of a dam right now and probably an inactive dam if it wasn't for activists that, that fought the good fight um, and helped. But the, the work is still to come. And so I'm reminded also, I like to share a quick antidote. Um, my first week um, as the executive director, I found myself at Mass General Store um, in Boone, North Carolina, and it was National Land Trust Day. And the owners, the Coopers were so gracious to um, donate, pro donate proceeds of the sales uh, to the New River Con uh, Conservancy. Um, and, and donors would come in and round up and proceeds went to our nonprofit organization. Um, but there were a lot of tourists coming through the, the area um, that would stop at our, our table and see all of the, the signs and maps and efforts that we're doing. And I would hear things like, oh, that's a national river, so it's protected now. Oh, that's part of a, a national park, so it's, it's all good. Um, and, and I was kind of waving, stop, come back, let me tell you more about the new river. Um, yes, there are sections of it that are, are protected, but the fight's not over. There's still a lot of work to be done. Um, and so thinking about tonight's theme and, and how um, environmentalism intersects um, with the theme of this evening, I think the duty of care is a resounding theme that there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, there's still um, endangered species um, in the New River, like our candy darters. Um, there's flora and fauna throughout the watershed area. And every single day, we need to be working hard to keep our water clean, to keep the land around it preserved, um, to keep that habitat intact. Um, because at the core essence of it, you know, water is essential for all life forms to exist. And if we don't care for it, um, we can have a lot of danger on the horizon. So just a couple of facts about the New River Conservancy. Um, I think our, our logo and mission statement is just so beautiful. And so I, I'd like to um, just highlight that um, our mission is to protect the waters, the woodlands, um, and the wildlife of the New River watershed. And the New River watershed, again, is it's a three state um, region that starts at the headwaters in North Carolina and flows north through, Vir through Virginia um, and into Virginia um, to America's newest national park, the New River National Gorge um, Park and Preserve. What a mouthful. Um, and I understand that tourism is just really bumping this year. We've got a lot of attention in, in West Virginia. Um, the superintendent has been a really good asset to the New River Conservancy with a lot of the, the policy and the staff and the funding and the efforts that we're doing. But the, um, the work exists throughout all three states. Um, whenever I was interviewing for the job, I uh, looked at the strategic plan and there's three core pillars that the board of directors have focused in on um, to, to focus our efforts, um, outreach and resource development, policy engagement, and science and research. So thinking about protecting all of those um, conservation easements up and down the watershed, um, but also thinking about creating resources so that we can continue to do our important work. Um, as a nonprofit, we're funded primarily through grants and also with the support of private donors that enable us to do the good work every day. Um, policy engagement is another pillar that we're really focusing on, and policy engagement looks different in um, not just every state, but really in every municipality. Um, up and down the watershed, um, you know, throughout uh, Virginia and West Virginia, we have a um, Mountain Valley Pipeline that's coming through. So next week, I'll be in two public forums um, led by the Army Corps of Engineer, one for Virginia and one for West Virginia, talking about some policy advocacy, that work that we're doing. 
Uh, we also have a lot of research universities um, and educational institutions up and down the watershed. So focusing in on science and research is, is very important to us. And I will put a, a quick plug in um, April, we are planning our biannual New River Symposium. So we'll be bringing together scientists and students, um, advocates, um, uh, from all over the region um, and even outside our region. The, this year, the symposium will be at the National Park, um, April 10th through the 13th. All are welcome to attend and we're working hard on sponsorships right now so that we can make it affordable for everyone. So those are the, the three main goals of the New River Conservancy. Um, this is a map that I like to show. Um, again, it, it has the, the river and the three states and all of these dots um, on the state are different areas that water watchers have monitored throughout the years. Um, and so we have an immense database that we work um, in all three states with uh, the different state agencies where we've collected water over a long period of time. Um, and we work with all the different municipalities to really understand what does that mean? What are some of the tributaries um, and creeks and of course the river that we need to protect? Um, I, I like to use the analogy, um, it, it's very much like your, uh, your heart. Um, we love the new river, um, but there's a lot of veins that go, um, that go through our body that lead to the heart. And so those veins are uh, similar to all of the different tributaries to the new river. Um, and it's all connected. If, if there's pollution coming in through one creek or one tributary, it's going to affect the entire watershed. We also have staff in each of the three states, um, which is really exciting. Um, and as we were mentioning before, in this new world of Zoom, we're all becoming, um, you know, familiar with the virtual world. We have our staff meeting every week via Zoom uh, with folks coming in from, from North Carolina, Virginia, and uh, West Virginia. Um, duty of care um, is something that's a lot of fun to talk about um, because we have fun doing it and it's very quantifiable and frankly there's really great pictures that come out of it too. So in this picture is my predecessor George Santucci um, and Chelsea Blunt who's our director of restoration and this is a very common scene. Um, that happens multiple times throughout the year where we lead river cleanups and, and get trash out of the river. Um, and again, trash is fun to talk about because it's quantifiable. We've been keeping data since 2001. Um, so far this year, um, we've collected over 14,200 pounds of trash. Um, right now, we're through a grant, we're able to employ a lot of our river guides up in West Virginia. Um, you know, as the, the river guide season is winded down, um, they're, they're grateful for some extra funding, um, but they're also cognizant that, you know, how important it is to keep the river clean. So um, by the end of this year, these numbers um, are, are going to grow immensely when we think about how many tires that we've pulled out of the river. Um, I, I think it's already at about 160 tires year to date. Um, and since the, the course of us collecting data, um, it's over 13,000 tires right now. Gosh, is it hard to wrap your mind around that many pounds of trash or that many tires? It sure is for me. Um, so uh, some examples I like to use, 14,200 pounds um, is the equivalent of, fun fact, one African elephant, nine and a half cows, um, and 1,775 chickens. So um, just think about one African elephant has come out of the New River already this year. Um, another fun fact, the largest animal to ever exist on planet Earth is the blue whale, um, which weighs about 440,000 pounds. Um, by the end of the year, my prediction is that we will have exceeded um, collecting over 440,000 pounds out of the blue, out of the new river. So if um, you've contributed in our uh, river cleanups, and I know Grayson County just, gosh, the month of August did so many different river cleanups and, and really helped. So anybody that was a part of that can help to say that you, you helped pull a blue whale out of the new river. And, and I think that's a fun fact. This um, this slide illustrates just how large a blue whale is with the, the human being being one part of it. 
So when I speak to the different groups who help us with our river cleanups, um, especially students um, that come out, I like to, you know, talk about why are we doing what we're doing? Why is it important to keep trash out of the river? Um, because again, you know, water is, is essential for all life forms to exist. So by helping uh, to keep our river clean, you're helping saving lives. Um, and, and that's something that I, I think is fun to rally around. Uh, but we do so much more than simply river cleanups. Um, we have a river builder program and Chelsea Blunt leads this program. And again, there's a lot of numbers that we collect to quantify um, how much of our river stream up and down the watershed we're able to preserve. Um, another great illustration of, of why this is important um, that really resonates for me, when you see the, the uh, river and you often see the stream beds, unfortunately, sometimes we see stream beds where the owners will mow right up to the end of the river um, because it looks pretty, right? Um, but actually what that's doing is destroying the riparian buffer zone, which is so crucial um, to keep our river healthy. And so sometimes it, it might not look pretty whenever you see that there's a lot of growth, a lot of vegetation, and the, the, the trees are forming a canopy over the river. What that actually means is it's pretty healthy. So if you think about your air conditioning unit, um, and perhaps uh, you're like me, and every three months you're in charge of changing out the filter um, to keep that air conditioning running strong. Um, think about that filter and how important it is to keep you know, all of the junk from coming into your house and keeping your air clean. Well, that's what a riparian buffer zone really is. It's that filter. Um, so the, the um, uh, maybe it's your agriculture um, chemicals that are in the ground or your pollution or um, storm water that's running through the ground. If you have a really healthy riparian um, buffer zone with shrubs and live stakes, um, that's your filtration system that helps filter all of that out so that we can have a clean water for, um, for all of our species to survive. Um, and also the shade will help the temperature of the water, which is really important. Um, especially with a, a lot of our species that need the cooler waters in order to survive. Um, so right now we're beginning to kick off our river building season. Um, as we, we wind it down our river cleanup season with the warm weather, cooler weather is actually the perfect time to come out and start um, really examining and working on our, our uh, stream beds. Um, and we hope to work with at least 11 landowners this next season um, that are on our wait list. So um, if you'd like more information, I'm happy to connect you with our restoration director and, and work with you um, with our river builder program. And so here are some more just kind of fun facts of um, year to date, what we've done. Um, we uh, have a goal of four miles uh, by 2023, and we're, we're going to exceed that goal. We've, we've almost um, accomplished three by the end of 2021. So we might need to add a stretch goal um, to that. And again, as a nonprofit uh, agency, a lot of this work is done through grants and through donations of, of folks helping to keep our, our our stream beds uh, pretty healthy. Um, restoration projects is another area of the New River Conservancy, and this is funded largely through grants um, that we have. And so we are right now actually just closing out three of our major projects um, where we've gone in and uh, with, with the uh, help of some big grants, we've been able to hire contractors to come in and, um, and secure some areas with some heavy stones that they bring in and heavy machinery to really create a strong, healthy infrastructure. Um, if you've been to Elk Shoals, which is in Ash County, that's one of our uh, gem accomplishments. We've just finished phase two, which is uh, rewilding Elk Shoals. So we were able to come in and remove a lot of invasive species um, that had taken over and then replace them with indigenous species to create a healthier, healthier environment. My screen is freezing. Sorry, I had trouble getting to my next slide. Um, these are just some of the many projects that we worked on throughout 2021. Um, the Middle Fort Greenway is a, a project that we've had um, going on with many other agencies, and we've really taken the lead on stream bank restoration, but there's many facets to the Middle Fort project. 
Um, so again, these, these are projects that we are um, completing for the most part. The Pulaski uh, Peak Creek in Virginia, our flood mitigation plan is complete. Um, but just because the project is complete doesn't mean that it's over. Often it means we can go into phase two or phase three, or it leads to the next big project that we have going on. Um, we need your help. So I've talked about some of the programs that we do um, and the importance of having donors and activists um, that, that work with us. But here are three simple things that every citizen can do every single day um, that, that don't cost anything. Um, so I, I just bring this to your attention and ask, um, help keep trash out of the river. Um, there's so many, um, you know, things that we can do, whether it's bringing our, um, you know, grocery, our own grocery bag to the grocery store um, so that we don't see our stream beds just riddled with those plastic bags that put trash in the river, keeping our tires out of the river. Um, that, that's a big thing that you can help um, help us to just keep our environment clean. Um, telling our story. Again, we've had some really great victories happen so far that enable us to have this gem, um, but the fight's not over. There's still a lot of work to be done. Um, every single day, um, there's, there's species that we need to be working on to preserve. Um, and another simple thing that we can ask of you is to follow and share our social media. Um, I think we, we all spend time on whether it's Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn. Um, we have a great communications director that will um, talk about some of the fun facts that we're doing, highlight the work of all of our partners, especially Grayson County and the, the wonderful work that's happened there. Um, you know, the heroes that have come before us um, and the folks that are inspired um, to come out today. So those are three basic things that, um, that we ask for you to do. Um, and I, I'm happy to continue this conversation with, uh, with many others. I know that I'm one of three speakers for this evening, and I, I think I'm coming up closely on my 10 minutes of time. So I'm happy to answer some questions now or, or yield the floor back to you, Laura. Okay. Well, I think, um, I think what we'll do is do all three presentations and then we'll open up the salon so and since you're all speaking generally on the same topic with with various areas of expertise I think I think that will be the way to go so I'm going to go ahead and introduce our next speaker uh, but thank you very much Elizabeth that was fantastic before I do um Kathy Cole she was born and raised in Grayson County and she graduated from Emory and Henry College she then earned a master's degree at in psychology at Hollins College, and she got her PhD at the University of Oregon. She is a Kellogg National Fellow, and she worked for the Department of Veterans Affairs for 30 years as a psychologist and leadership educator. In 2009, Kathy moved back to the Virginia Highlands. and She became active in Grace and Land Care. First, she served as secretary, and today she serves as president. She fundraises for Grace and Land Care and contributes to our local independence farmers market. Kathy is an avid gardener. She sings in the Highland Camerata and she is active in her church of the Good Shepherds. So Kathy, you're up to bat and tell us about Grace and Land Care and more about this, this region that is under the protection of uh, you women. Thank you, Laura. Thinking about this topic sent me back to um, Anthony Flacavento's rural progressive platform from a few years ago. And this sentence from it, rural regions share a sense that nature is part of how we meet our needs, feed ourselves, create jobs and livelihoods. The mountains, forests, valleys, and streams are a practical part of our lives and economies. So in a rural area, environmentalism doesn't mean protecting nature by walling it off from people. It needs, we need to find sustainable ways to use the land, ways that are good for us and for the future. One of the first things Grace and Land Care did um, 
And that is in large part because Charlotte was one of the founding members. Um, they tackled the major industry, which is raising beef cattle and did a lot of research and um, actually began a grass-fed beef industry that uses rotational grazing and other techniques that is good for the land so that the land isn't overgrows, overgrown, it's constantly renewed. Um, one of those early people, Danny Boyer, has continued to do research on how good soil promotes good forage, which results in healthy animals, a better tasting product and more profit for the farmer. So this continues even today to figure out for this industry, how can we do it in a way that's good for the environment? Another uh, tradition here is having a home vegetable garden. The farmer's market under Michelle Pridgen has offered workshops every spring and they keep refining it, making it better and better on how to raise vegetables in Grayson County with this soil, this growing season, what does best? How can you get absolutely the most and the most nutritious food out of your plot of land and make the soil healthier every year? So that's been our focus and we are a member led organization. Um, when someone has a passion that fits with our mission, then we all jump in and help them realize that passion. The most recent example was food independence. When um, Anita Simpson, who was raised here and they were not wealthy, said, you know, I have, a, I have a real heart for the people that are struggling to feed themselves. We need to do something. So they have actually created a new food pantry that's providing food for an awful lot of people. Well, I had a passion myself. I had always wanted to have a place where people could bring what they didn't need and people could take it if they needed or wanted. This actually goes back to my graduate school days in the 70s. So I never forgot this idea, but neither did I ever own a warehouse. So, so I couldn't figure out how I was going to make it happen. But after I retired and moved to Independence, the perfect place opened up to do this. And Grace and Landcare supported me in starting the free market. Now we'll see if I can share some pictures. Okay. Um, not sure how to get it on slideshow. Anyway, this is the building. It was formerly Briar Patch Metal Works. It was an HVAC business for many years. The owner had died. His children who live in Blacksburg couldn't sell the building, couldn't sell the inventory, and it was just really a millstone around their necks. Well, I knew the daughter and she's, uh, she's very environmentally conscious and started talking to them about using their building to build the free market. Todd Price created our sign for us and we were off and running. This was in, we opened in September of 2017. So what kind of things can you find there? Baskets, how many people have baskets of all kinds? This has been our really hot item, canning jars. Oh my goodness. Canning jars and egg cartons come and go really fast and save people a lot of money. Greeting cards. When greeting cards can cost $5 a pop, people can come and get greeting cards. And um, I know one organization that asked for 85 Christmas cards so they could send Christmas cards to everyone in the nursing home. We were happy to do that. We had plenty. Um, wooden pallets. The county gets those and didn't know what to do with them. Well, if they put them on our dock, they will disappear. People use wooden pallets for all kinds of things, building fences, building compost bins. 
three ring binders. Never buy a three ring binder. You can find exactly what you need at our place. So just all kinds of things, packing boxes, um, shipping boxes. If I need to send something to my family in Austin, I know I can find exactly the right size box there. So I don't have to keep my basement full of boxes because I know I can get them there. We have partnered with lots of organizations, uh, the Lions Club. We have a, a collection box for eyeglasses and hearing aids. I think we're the only place in independence you can take those. Um, Department of Social Services and Mount Rogers. We keep a space in the back with the very best housewares for people who maybe have been homeless and are now getting an apartment. Um, women who've had to leave their homes and not couldn't take anything with them. Anybody who has a need, we do ask that, that we have a referral from a church, a social agency, somebody who can verify that that person has the need and we will give them whatever we have. Um, our Christmas gift shop, we hope we'll be able to do this year. This has been one of the most fun things. And it's all year we save things that are like new that would make nice presents. And we open the gift shop the first few hours just for kids to come and get presents for the people in their lives, their teachers, their parents, their siblings, um, so they can give gifts at Christmas. And then we open it to anybody else because one of the things we'd like to give is the joy of being able to give something to someone else. So um, some of the other people we partner with, um, county recycling, let me stop the pictures. Um, everything that we, we try not to throw things away. Sometimes we have to, but we try very hard to recycle anything we have to get rid of. Uh, we have a, a local guy who is a metal recycler. That's how he makes a few bucks. We save scrap metal for him. And in return, he will take things off the dock that need to go to the trash or to his burn pile. He's been a real good partner for us. Heart Moss Pottery uses recycled packing material. So we save things for them. They come and get a car load and give us a donation. It saves uh, Hannah a lot of money. And some of her clients, Mass General Store is one of them, she sells pottery wholesale. They really like the fact that she uses recycled packing material. That's a plus for them. So that's been a great partnership. Um, last year, of course, during the pandemic, we could not hold our Christmas gift shop. But when we thought about how can we get things to people who might need them, we partnered with Food Independence. So uh, in November, we gave every car that came through a little bag of Christmas ornaments. And for some of them, it just, it just brightened them up so much. They were just thrilled to get that. And then in December, we gave stuffed toys and uh, hand-knitted hats to all the children of the families who came through. Um, when we do get clothing, we don't take clothing, but sometimes it sneaks in. We take that to Allegheny Cares and Independence. When we get books, we take that to the used bookstore in Sparta. Um, Allegheny Cares has also brought us some sewing machines that they can't sell, but we have been able to give them away. So we've tried to partner with all kinds of people in the community and Basically, I think of us as an animal shelter for orphaned stuff. We try to find a good home and the appropriate home for all your stuff to keep it out of the landfill. So I will be glad to take your questions, but that's a, that's a quick rundown on, on what I've been doing. Kathy, thank you so much. And yeah, the free store is amazing. I forgot to put that in your bio, major omission. Um, yeah, it, it really is um, just a local treasure. And we, we go there, we bring things and we, and we 
take things um, ourselves for, for Oracle and for people who come here. So yeah, that's a great story and it's a successful story. All right, so we're gonna move on to our third um, guest speaker tonight and that is Charlotte Haynes. And Charlotte graduated from East Carolina University where she was a member of the Phi Kappa Phi Honor Society. She started her career as a physical therapist and was director of the physical therapy department at AP Memorial Hospital in North Carolina and later a partner in Rockingham Orthopedic Associates. Midlife, however, Charlotte changed careers to focus on farming and environmentalism. Today, she is the CEO of River Ridge Farm, a 1,500-acre farm located along the New River in Grayson County. Our campus, Oracle Campus, uh, is a neighbor of Charlotte's farm, and we love being so close to her farming operations. River Ridge specializes in naturally raised beef and organic berries. The farm serves as a demonstration of livestock production for the region's cattle farmers and is an ongoing research partner with Virginia Tech. In addition, as Kathy mentioned, Charlotte helped found Grayson Land Care, uh, which is a farming methodology, I'm sorry. Yeah, which is a farming methodology that originated in Australia and is now followed in over 14 countries around the world. Charlotte also has served as a board member of Rachel's Network, a national organization dedicated to creating a network of women conservationists and a leading voice for the environment. So Charlotte, you bring it on home with your presentation and uh, inspire us some more, please. Thank you, Laura, for that introduction. And uh, I just think uh, what Elizabeth said is just because I got more age on the, the environmentalism than you do. But uh, and I've always been in awe of Kathy because she is so smart and so willing to give. And then she's always smiling about it, just happy. It's not, it's not a chore for her. She's, she's a genuine giver. And um, I got my first slide, which is kind of funny, but um, Katie's going to put it up. And th this is all about farming and environmentalism. When you when you look at this slide and you say, you know, what what do you see? Because I get bombarded about growing cattle, and that's not sustainable. And doing this is not sustainable. And I, I'm just I'm trying to do my best, and it's. It's a compromise on a lot of situations um, because ideally the, the whole planet needs to get together and, and really feel a passion for saving the planet. And when that's gonna happen, Laura, I don't know, but Laura is almost starting at a different level from, from me where she has taught me a lot about you know, how, how this is going to happen, why it needs to happen. And here I am poking along down at the, at the lower rungs, but this is kind of just where I belong at the, at the grassroots level. And so um, when you talk about my, my cattle production, I get all these questions of, uh, that isn't sustainable. Uh, how big is the carbon footprint on your cattle farm? You know, everybody says we're pro cattle are producing more methane gas and blah, blah, blah. Um, can, can we live without growing meat? Can we live without eating meat? Um, I'm sure we can, but there's a lot of ifs and, and the way our economy is right now, it, it's just a lot of questions. Are, are we gonna eat from test tubes in the future? We'll, we'll just have to see about that. Um, but if, I tell people in our rolling hills of Virginia, if we don't graze it, it's really hard to cultivate it. And we've got pumpkins, we got Christmas trees. Those are our two biggest products and they're ornamentals. So I don't consider those sustainable. And, you know, but these people need to make money then on the land. So that's what they're growing because they do, they wouldn't grow them if they couldn't make uh, a little bit of profit off of them, but it's really good grazing land in our area. So if we're not going to graze, you know, people say, well, just let it go back into trees. 
And I'm going, and how economical is that for the landowner? When hardwoods, you can't harvest those, but every hundred years. And white pines, maybe every 40 years and Christmas trees every eight to 10 years. And then your land is so polluted, you can't grow anything on those. So there's, there's just a lot of um, two peers out there to, to try to deal with when you're in agriculture. And small farms are, are not profitable. If you're looking at the farm and family has a Mercedes and they go on three European vacations a year, yeah, it, it's not profitable. But it is profitable if you want to have a healthy life and a good life and an active life. And if you have the gene for farming, which is a lot of work, it, it's profitable in other ways. And that's when the spirituality, I think, comes into it. Because I look at the people that are not going back to those jobs now that they, that they had. And they said they're tired of of waiting tables and rude people and bosses telling them that they're replaceable and their salaries being the, the very lowest. And some of them are opting out and they're actually coming to live off the land. And I, I hope Grayson County gets more of them because um, that's kind of what we're about here in Grayson County. So um, managing land, it, Every acre on the planet should be managed. And that, that's a big project, I think. But on my farm, that's what we've looked at. What is the best use of every piece of land or every acre, really? And Virginia Tech helped us do this plan. And it, it would be amazing to do it on a world scale and then have carbon credits and sequestering carbon and places like Brazil and the Amazon that, you know, if we could pay those countries and those landowners to not try to develop it because they're not being successful, but they're ruining the planet. So that takes a world organization to put this all together. And I think eventually we'll have it, but it may be after multiple disasters that, that this happens. So um, if you look at uh, the next slide that I, I put up, was this, I saw this at the School of the Arts and they were talking more about where the arts fit into the gross national product. But when I saw agriculture down there at the very bottom, wow. and then you've got health and health services way up there, those two things could be reversed because if people ate healthier, if they wanted to eat healthier, if they put more of their income towards healthy eating, we could put health services at the bottom and, and put agriculture more near the top. So that's kind of one of my goals in life is to try to see if we can nudge agriculture a little higher. And we, we don't pay enough for our food here in this country. Other countries, some countries, the people spend over half their income for food. And in the United States, it's probably 8% of their income goes towards food. And then you don't know if it's going towards healthy food or not. And so it's a, it's a big um, paradox coming on. Um, but I, I love this graph. So uh, besides raising the cattle, which we do, the things to make it more sustainable, we do rotational grazing. We, to do what you call mob grazing and really force the animals to eat every bit of, of what's out there available to them and not eat it down too low. That takes water in every paddock and that's an expense to put water in every paddock. So we can't do that on a realistic scale but more and more people in our area are doing more rotational grazing and they're fencing off their riparian areas, which greatly helps the water source that helps us keep water in our area. Because if you, if you let, as Elizabeth said, let that water run straight into the river, straight from the streams and straight into the river, we're losing it. We need to keep it. 
and to keep it, we need to have plants on our streams, let our riparian areas be natural, don't graze them, fence them off. Um, animal, the, the farm animals want to drink clean water. If you put a water tank out for them, run the creek water into the water tank, and then the overflow goes back into the creek, 100% of the time, they will drink out of that water tank. They won't stand in the creek. They won't poop in the creek. They'll drink that clean water. And it's really an easy thing to do, but it's a harder thing to convince us humans to, to do it. But I'm also doing um, organic berries. And uh, so I've got a, a berry picking. You put the next slide up. And that just shows that this was taken like two weeks ago. We still, I pick raspberries today. This is a true sign of global warming that we still have these raspberries to pick. And we've already sent our pickers home. And a lot of these are just, just going to waste. And I've, I've called people, please, please come and pick some. But what Jay and I want to do is to pick them and freeze them and be able to sell them as a frozen product. But it, it's still sinful to see such beautiful berries going to waste. And then the, the next slide shows uh, that we, we're not a, on a farmer's market level when you have 10 acres of organic berries. So you have to think about distribution, marketing, nice little boxes like this. More expenses come in that somebody just trying to start into farming have a hard time with. And I think Grace and Landcare can help these people get businesses started with teaching them how to apply for grants and networking them with other people that are already doing some of these projects. And so that's a, that's a big plus for Grace and Landcare to, to have this network. And so then the other slide that uh, it shows Charles and me <laughs> in, in the uh, Grace and Natural truck, which usually hauls uh, meat, but we've hauled berries in that thing. It's broken down in some weird places, and but it's another thing you have to think about if you're if you're in the business. And a lot of people say, "Well, I'm going to grow a natural garden, and everybody's going to want my products so badly that um, they'll pay any price and they'll come." But you have to be realistic about your markets and. It's, it's really hard when you can't sell what you've grown and spend a lot of time growing. So having a network of distribution would, would really be good for our area. And we've tried it before, learned a lot, and we, we've tried it again, and we're, we're gonna get there with, with more distribution out of Grayson County can feed a lot of people in, in, in our region that, that has a population of half the population of the United States is probably within five, 500 miles of us on the, this side of the Mississippi. So we, we do send beef to Washington DC area and in Maryland. We, I've had people from Atlanta say they got a box of my blueberries because of the distribution, but we need to have more money coming to the farmers. Um, then I have an, another slide that's very important to me is the children and the young people that we need to get involved. And uh, I've been working with Wake Forest the past couple of weeks with their sustainability students. And these people are, they're so gun ho to save this planet and we can't lose that, that initiative and that force and that passion and that desire. And I like to start early with these little kids and, and Grayson Landcare has a school program where we have school garden and Michelle pridgen has been in charge of that and just beg everybody. Elizabeth is nodding her head over there that we, you know, keep those kids involved and Blue Ridge Discovery Center is doing the same thing, but you can see these kids are in love with this lamb and, and they're just naturally drawn to, to taking care of, of animals and plants. And then it's, it's taught out of them by the time they get to be adults. So let, let's teach them and, and, and get them to hold on to that. Um, so there was another thing that I looked up and it's called the drawdown project. And it, it, that was something that Wake Forest was showing me. And so if you wanna make a note of that, the, 
it's a student program and, and we could get more of our schools, you know, grade schools and everything involved with the drawdown project. And there was another one, the solutionproject.org. It was another good one. And then the, the final slide that Kay is going to put up is that it's, for me, I've had a lot of good luck in my life and I'm always finding these four leaf clovers. So uh, uh, that's what it takes in a way. It, it, good luck doesn't come just naturally though. It comes from studying, from experiencing, from listening to all angles of everybody's input, you know, learning and, and sharing in order to accomplish these goals of literally saving the planet. We, we're really in dire need of, of, of reaching these goals. So good luck to everybody. Thank you. Wow, uh, each one of you could have been the main facilitator for a salon. And I just I just am so grateful that all three of you ladies um, could come on in the same night, um, share what's happening down here um, in our, our piece of the Virginia Highlands. And I am just grateful that I live here and there are people like you who are um, helping to lead the way.